So it's a real pleasure today to welcome Charlie Kimball, um, current IndyCar driver to our University of Florida Motorsports Forum. Um, Charlie, let, let's see if I can walk backwards a little bit and sort of recoup some high points in, that I remember about your history. Um, originally born in Britain, right? Correct. Grew up in California. Yes. Uh, raced a fair amount as a, as a young guy. You were in cards. You did F3 in Europe, and you were pretty successful until, what, 2007 when yep, you were diagnosed right. with type 1? Um, so that sort of changed things for you a little bit, but you came right back on track with Indy, with Indy, Indy Car, or no, Indy Lights. Yep. Right, you started with Indy Lights? That's right. And that's where you began your relationship with Novo Nordisk, yep. the pharmaceutical manufacturer who specializes in type 1 therapeutics. And right? diabetes, yep. Yeah, yep. they're a global healthcare company that originally, historically started in diabetes care, and I've been on their insulin since I was diagnosed in 2007. And then you and Novo Nordisk went to Ganassi Racing for IndyCar, and this was 09? Uh, 2011. 2011. So after the two, light, two years in Indy Lights, my first, my rookie season in IndyCar was 2011. Yes. Um, in the 83 car for Chip Ganassi Racing. Yeah, yeah. fabulous team. Uh, and it showed between your talent and their car, um, you won your first IndyCar race at Mid-Ohio in 2013. That's right. And then in a completely different series, you were running the Daytona 24 and you won your class there. Or did you win overall? We, overall, right? We won overall. I was part of a team uh, with Scott Pruitt driving Memo Rojas and Juan Pablo Montoya uh, in the 01 uh, that was the, prototype. That was the target team back then for Ganassi, yep. right? Yeah. both. So they ran two prototypes at the 24 hours. Yep. They ran one all year long, uh, but they ran two. And I got to join the full-time drivers, Memo Rojas and Scott Pruitt, and it was the Telmex target car. Yeah. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Like, the unique challenge, A, of having a roof over my head. It was the first time I'd driven a car <laughs> with a roof. But also, driving from 2.30 to 4 in the morning when it's pretty cool, it's dark, there's you know, not a whole lot of fan spectacle in the middle of the night, and, yeah. and all the mechanics are trying to catch catnaps between... The, the fuel stops, and usually it's the engineer on the timing stand and the spotter on the top of the roof that are awake, yeah. and it's a whole different perspective because multiple classes as well. When you're running a prototype, you're the fastest car on track, yeah. so you're passing GT cars, slower cars, and one of the mantras that the team taught us as kind of one-off drivers was the idea is to hand the car to the next driver in the lineup in the same state that you got it. Um, you, you talk about uh, visiting a campsite and leave it as well or better than you found it. Same thing with a prototype in a 24 hour race or a race car over an endurance like that. It's about keeping the car in good enough shape to go compete at the end yeah. of the race. Yeah, yeah. So I've often wondered at Daytona at night, how well is a driver can you identify the cars coming up behind you? Can you tell by the pattern of their lights or the colors of their lights what they are? Or you've got a spotter and it doesn't matter? A little bit of both. Um, it, it always matters. <laughs> and so identifying, and we were, we were in the top five and leading most of through the middle of the night. So I was passing a lot of slower cars. And so recognizing the speed differentials yeah based on taillights and the reflective class tag on the bumpers, but also understanding the headlights behind me yeah. were a big thing. Yeah. Um, and understanding the headlights and shape of headlights behind me, where they were quick, even if they were other prototypes yeah. saying, okay, well, that's that car and okay, he's gonna get close to me down the straight, but as soon as we hit the infield section, I'm gonna pull out again yeah. or vice versa. And yeah. so. There is a lot there, and um, one of the technologies that I think is really incredible, I know Pratt & Miller have developed with Chevrolet Racing, the Corvette program. There's a screen that's like, I think it must be infrared camera, and it's a rear-facing camera, and based on, it pulls data from the timing loops on the racetrack and the headlight data and will produce different signs over the car headlights, so the driver can look essentially in the rear view mirror and see what car is coming up, if they're racing for position, if they're in their class, if they should be faster, if they should be. 
so much information pulled from a camera and the electronic system. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a jet fighter. It, I mean, it's essentially a heads-up display yeah. that the you know the new strike fighter. They talk about the helmets being yeah. able to look through the plane. Yeah, and it's very similar. I mean, we race fighter jets on the ground, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, while I love Daytona Twenty Four, I get to go there pretty often. Um, I really think of you most as an Indy car driver, and was really excited for you in twenty fifteen when you got your first podium at the five hundred. I was there. It was um, a good way, it good was day at the office. Very exciting. Very exciting. Um, what must that have been like to stand up there at Indianapolis Motor Speedway on that podium and be in front of the crowd after all that racing? Well, the really interesting thing about the Indianapolis 500 is there is no podium. That you finish third, but you don't get a trophy. You don't get a recognition on a podium because every other sport in the world, the Olympics, horse racing, there's win, play, show. Yeah. Every other racetrack in the world, you talk about a podium. But at Indianapolis, the only car that matters is the one in victory lane. <laughs> and the only, only driver that gets their face on a trophy on the Borg Warner is the winner. The only one that drinks milk. Yep. So yes, you get press conference, you get points, you get uh, more prize money, all of that thing, but you don't actually get a trophy. So it's really unique. And, and I always joke that in that race especially- or a watch, you don't get a watch. No, no watches no watch for that, is, yeah. nothing. Um, but the really, uh, with that event, I always say in that race, I was one bad decision away from winning the <laughs> Indy 500 because either Juan Pablo Montoya leading the race or yep. Will Power in second make one bad decision in those last six laps, I think yep. it was, yep. and I'm in the catbird seat. I yep. pick up the pieces and my face is, my life's changed forever. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the greatest things about the Indianapolis 500, though, is that when you win, it changes your life. Yeah. Mario Andretti, I think most everybody, motorsports fans or not, would recognize Mario Andretti's name. I mean, he, he's in like an Eminem lyric, he's in a, I'm sure he's in a Drake, <laughs> like, you know, he's, he's, as far as mainstream driver, AJ, For, AJ Foyt, excuse me, Mario Andretti, some of the biggest names that have transcended racing to pop culture. Mario Andretti won pretty much everything on the planet. You know, won Le Mans, won 24 Hours of Daytona. He won the IndyCar Championship. He won races all over the world. He is always introduced as the 1969 Indy 500 race winner. Yeah. You win the Indianapolis 500, you always are introduced as an Indianapolis 500 winner. Yeah. AJ Foyt, my team owner this year, the first four-time winner. He... You mentioned A.J. Foyt's name, and everyone says A.J. Foyt, Indy 500. Sure. He won Le Mans in yeah. a Ford GT. People don't talk about that. No. They don't talk about him winning the Hoosier 100 in a sprint car <laughs> the night before he won an Indy 500. They talk about the Indianapolis 500. Anywhere in the world. I live in Indianapolis now. Anywhere I go in the world. Where do you live? Oh, Indianapolis. Oh, the 500. That, you know, it's basketball and race cars. It's pacers and racers yeah. in Indy, and that's about it. <laughs> So as a Texas kid growing up in Fort Worth, A.J. Foyt was a hero. I had his autograph, which my dad got for me at an airport one time. Um, and now you get to drive for this legend, and you're the number four Chevy this year, right? Correct, the number four car. Yeah, yeah so how exciting is that to be with this team? It's fantastic. Um, funny story, so A.J. turned 85 earlier this year, and it was his birthday, and I, I, I saw it and got a notification i thought i should reach out i mean he's my boss now like i should reach out wish him a happy birthday um so his son larry runs the race team is president of operations for the race team so i texted larry and i say hey, you know can i get aj's number i want to reach out and wish him a happy birthday and uh, he sends it to me and, and so i call and he he goes i will warn you he probably won't pick up because he won't know your number yeah all right so i call and I, you know this number blah 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 leave a voicemail and uh, I swore I sounded like a freshman asking the prom queen out for a date. I was like, uh, hey, happy, happy birthday, AJ. Uh, <laughs> you know, 85 years, that's, that's really impressive. Blah, blah, like, I have no idea what I said. But like, you know those moments where your brain, your brain to goes totally blank? <laughs> and I was terrified. 
And he calls me back. And of course, I save his number in my phone, yeah. right? So my phone, it comes up, AJ for you calling me. And I was in an airport and I wanted to like scream to the gate, look who's calling. <laughs> oh man. And he just wanted, you know, he said, oh, thanks for the birthday wishes. And then he wanted to talk racing. Oh, and, that's great. And that's what really, really proved to me that he's a racer, that he just wants to race. And, and getting to race for his team this year is such an opportunity because. It's very family oriented. Um, it's it's very motivated. Everybody wants to be successful for AJ. They know he's 85. They know that getting the cars back to doing well, and and I think readjusting what that level looks like, mm-hmm. because IndyCar is so competitive with five Andretti cars, three Penske cars, three Ganassi cars. That's 11 cars from the big three. Yeah. So a top 10 is a pretty good barometer. Yeah. You know, top five, podiums, a win, those are all possible, but we've got as a team to rebuild the foundation. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of fun this year. A lot of work, but also a lot of fun. So you were testing with them last night? Correct. You're firing up for the first race, which is in St. Petersburg, the middle of March, right? 15th, That's right, March that right? 13th to the 15th. Yep. Um, I'll head down, I go back to Indianapolis, back to the cold to freeze up again, <laughs> and then back down to St. Pete on Thursday the 12th to go through pre-event meetings with the engineers. I'll do a track walk with the engineers, make sure everything's ready to go for the race weekend. My helmet, visors, um, go through tech with my helmet, make sure it's all cleared and ready to run. And then two practices on Friday, two 45-minute practices Friday, 45-minute practice Saturday morning, a qualifying Saturday afternoon, a 30-minute warm-up Sunday morning to practice pit stops, fuel mileage, and then uh, just over a two-hour race Sunday afternoon. Now, this is a street course, right? So in brief, how is a street course sort of different than a traditional race course, a traditional road race? So one of the unique aspects of IndyCar racing is that we are a very diverse series. We race on four main types of racetracks. Um, The first one's super speedways. So the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Texas Motor Speedway, real high speed sort of dromes of speed. Um, The short ovals. Places like Iowa, Gateway, Richmond, anything that's less than a mile and a half. Uh, Iowa's seven-eighths of a mile will do a lap in 18, 19 seconds. Uh, So it's really at 185 miles an hour. That's crazy. So it's like flying fighter jets inside a gym. (laughs) And then we do permanent road courses. Places like Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course, Road America, the real old-school traditional racetracks. Play Sebring's permanent road course as well. We test there a lot. And then we race at these temporary <clears throat> circuits. Um, St. Pete is a combination of street course and airfield. So we use part of the runway and taxiway of, I think it's the Albert Witted uh, Airport there in St. Pete. But we also use city streets and parking lots mm-hmm. around the Dolly Museum. And because it's a temporary facility, they build the racetrack each year for us to come and race. Close the streets down, build it, but it means that the tracks aren't typically as smooth as a permanent road course. So how we approach them as a driver, the track walk's really important to see, to make sure that the track's been built the same way. The Mm -hmm. walls are in the same place as the year before, the curbs are the same, how things are painted. Um, If the city has come along and repaved one lane of the street, that changes how the race car works over that. Um, And so it's really important to see how that develops. And then because it's the first time race cars have put racing rubber on the track since the year before, Mm -hmm. the track gets a lot faster over the course of the weekend. It'll start really slippery. And then as we run and clean it off and put our rubber down, the grip goes up and so the lap times get faster and faster over the weekend. What's always frightened me about um, street courses like that is the short sight lines. You've got these walls, these barriers around you. So you're caught with these jet fighter pilots in a very narrow space going at a very high rate of speed. You can't see very far and you darn sure can't see through the corners. What must that be like? He, someone or I've heard street circuits referred to as racing through concrete canyons. Yeah. Because in the car, you're sitting essentially on the ground the top of my head is is three feet off the ground. I mean, my eye line is not very high, 
um, lower than I am in this chair right now. And so when you're down in there, you can't even see over the concrete walls in the fencing. You're literally looking at, at the concrete canyon. And so you have to really work mentally before you get there to be prepared for it. Um, and some of that mental preparation is knowing when to push the limits. Mm -hmm. Because IndyCar is so competitive that you, you can't leave six inches a foot to the wall. You've got to be leaving an inch, half an inch, quarter of an inch, tenth of an inch, sometimes using the wall to square the car up, uh, lightly brushing the wall at times. <laughs> and knowing when to finally take that last little bit to get the most lap time is is really important because you don't want to do it on the first lap of practice you don't want to do it every lap of the race but there are times you have to do it in the race for position um, and when you're in there and you can't see what's happening and it happens really quickly you become hyper aware of the corner marshals if they move and are grabbing a flag yeah, to yeah. let you know that you know there's a yellow coming out, you almost pre-respond in case there is a car stopped. You could get to the car before he could get the flag out. Right, yeah. exactly. Because if, if he's telling you there's a car spun through the next corner yeah. and it's just happened, you know, there are times where coming up on a corner and I see tire smoke and I think, and and then and the flag marshal's like looking down instead of watching the track, then I know there's a problem. Even yeah. though I haven't seen a yellow flag, I know yeah. there's a problem further ahead. So you start taking in these other information streams that you wouldn't normally use in driving to better protect yourself for what happens downstream of you on the track. It's fast. I've never heard a driver talk about that. That's fascinating. Um, you mentioned in the course of, of that, uh, last statement, you talked about the differences among the racetracks on which you compete. And I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about how different they are in terms of their physical demands on you as an athlete. Because mm -hmm. I know that they're, they're very different. And um, how does that feel from, from the driver's seat? They're very unique in the stress we as drivers feel. Um, and it's nice to hear you say drivers as athletes because I think that's the the uninitiated sometimes don't understand the physical challenges we face within the cockpit. And it's because we don't have power steering. We don't have power brakes. We have engines that produce seven, 800 horsepower in cars that weigh 16, 1800 pounds with aerodynamics that produce thousands of pounds of downforce. And when you couple that together, the load on us as drivers is, is really, really physical and really high. And on a, a street circuit, on a road course, it's a very dynamic racetrack. It's a lot of braking, downshifting, turning, accelerating, upshifting. So there's longitudinal load, there's lateral load, there's you know bumpiness, there's bottoming. And, and so you're kind of getting shaken about, bounced around, all while being thrown about by this car mm -hmm. that you're trying to wrestle and make it do what you want. <laughs> And then you go to a super speedway like Indianapolis and you do two and a half mi at 225 miles an hour average, you cover the length of a football field every second. Mm. So your eyeballs feel like they're on stocks because you're trying to look a mile ahead of you because you get there so quickly. We'll do two and a half miles in 40 seconds, but there's only four corners. Yeah. I say only but each corner is a complete commitment and a complete challenge of car and driver. And so physically, the physiological response is such that the adrenaline and the stress drives my, my heart rate up, yep. similar to a level that it is on a road and street circuit. But the physical response is a little lower. Mm -hmm. um, it's why a 500 mile race, I will burn similar calories than I will at say St. Pete which is a 200 mile race, but it's a little more stable, a little more constant, where if a road and street circuit was a dynamic event, a super speedway tends to be a more stable sort of it, racing on an oval. They say, think fast, but react slowly. Mm -hmm. Think fast, drive slow, because at that speed, you wanna make small adjustments and small driving corrections. 
So it, it seems to me that the 500, um, it seems to be a long race. You're out there for a long time. You've got some yellows that slow you down. Um, and it's at a time in Indianapolis when it can be wicked hot. Yeah. I mean, on us in the stands, it's like 100 degrees. You're sitting with a massive engine behind you and a layer of fire, fireproof clothing that's crazy. Um, what must the heat stress and the dehydration challenge be for you as a driver over the course of four or five or six hours if that race has delays in it? it it's one of the challenges we start preparing for the week before the race. We're looking at the weather, and if it's been hot and it's supposed to stay hot, we will start hydrating Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before the race on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, part of it, it, it's nice when practice is hot because your body, body acclimates to it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's one of the hardest when all of practice and qualifying week is cool weather and then carb day, the Friday before race day, or the Saturday before race day, heat wave shows up and it's 20 degrees hotter. Because not only have you never driven in that heat temperature on the track, but the engineers have never seen that yeah. track temp either. So yeah. it's a whole new challenge for them. And so from my side point, standpoint, it's hydrating all week, but it's also making sure that the drink system in the car works. Um, I've got yeah, a drink bottle. It, yeah. yeah, mine's unique because of my body being unique with diabetes, uh, I have a drink bottle that I fill with water and ice cubes as much as possible to try and keep it as cold as possible. And I have a second bottle filled with orange juice with extra sugar in it. Mm. So it's a higher glucose content um, so that if I need carbohydrates during the race, if I need sugar to keep going because of my blood sugar, I can get some from that bottle. And you mentioned my dad, uh, as an engineer, there are there's a valve that's mounted on my seat belt that my dad engineered, and we got 3D printed, that those two bottles come together. And from that valve, a tube runs right into my helmet. So I'm able to get fluids during the course of the race to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's no way for me to get a snack bar or granola bar or, any, or nutrition. Um, so I try and make sure that while it doesn't feel great eating a, a pretty good-sized nutrient rich lunch at 1030 on a Sunday morning. That's typically when my pre-race lunch happens because with the excitement of the race and everything, I'm usually up at about six or seven o'clock Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah, of course. So tell us, you mentioned the fact that you're, you're famous for the fact that you're the only type one diabetic competing at this high level in motorsport. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about how you manage your blood sugar. Uh, you've got a, a customized setup that's really impressive. How does that work? Yeah, as the first licensed driver with diabetes to ever race in the Indy 500, uh, I had to figure out how to keep track of what my body was doing during the race. The engineers have a lot of data streams to keep track of what's happening with the car, with the engine, with tire pressures, with temperatures, uh, voltages. There, I mean lots of different data, but I needed something that would keep track of my blood glucose while I was in the cockpit. Um, so I wear a Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. So I have a sensor on my body and it transmits to a display that actually plugs into the car's data system. So once it's in that data system, I can get that readout on my steering wheel. So I have speed, lap time, oil pressure, blood sugar, water temperature, gear, car and body data right there on my wheel. So I can keep track of what my body is doing. And then with the two drink bottles, I can give my body what it needs to be able to stay competitive, stay healthy, and keep my performance up to, to get the job done at the end of the race. That's terrific. And it seems to really work. It does. It's, it's taken a few iterations and a lot of evolution and learning, not only about my body, but also the systems we have in place. Uh, and also... For me, it's about learning as my diabetes evolves and changes. Um, had a great conversation with a diabetes researcher here at University of Florida today and talking about the evolution of the disease state within diabetes and, and from a, a research side and a, I'm gonna get this wrong, but an immunoresponse side and how antibodies work and how the disease starts, but then how it evolves has helped my understanding, even in a 30, 45 minute conversation with him, which I understood about 10% of, <laughs> I will admit, but gave me a better perspective about the evolution of my body, my physiology, so I can better prepare, train, 
and perform as a driver and an athlete. Uh, it's terrific. Um, before we go, I have to ask you to tell us another story about another conversation. Yes. Um, I've heard you talk in a very moving way about another time at Mid-Ohio when the day didn't go so well. Um, would you pick it up from there? Yeah, so it was, you talked about my win at Mid-Ohio in 2013. Yep. And I think the anecdote from 2014 at Mid-Ohio, the story really highlights for me the value of what I do within the diabetes community and, and the work with Novo Nordisk and the Race with Insulin program because I'd qualified really well and very similar to 2013, qualified in the top six, really looking forward to having a good car in the race, a little bit of strategy, a podium, maybe another win was in the cards. Five, 10 laps into the race, another driver it hits me, cuts my tire, I spin off, cause a yellow. I ended up finishing like 23rd, two laps down. And I remember getting out of the car and starting to walk back to the truck, had my helmet in my hand, and I, I didn't want to talk to anyone because I was pretty sure that the only thing was going to be four-letter words coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and this young gentleman who has type 1 like I do, and I've, I've known for years now, comes up to me, and, uh, and, and I didn't know what I was going to say. And those moments where it's like, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to handle this. And he comes up to me and he goes, I can't believe he hit you. How was your blood sugar? And it didn't matter to him where I finished. Yeah. If I was first, if I was third, if I was 23rd. Yeah. He wanted to know about how I'd managed my diabetes, what my blood sugar was, how it all worked. And that perspective, it... I will remember that story so vividly for the rest of my life because it reminded me that no matter what the result is on the racetrack, being out there and competing successfully, and being so vocal about overcoming the challenge of diabetes is really added a lot of balance to my life as a driver um, and frankly, a lot of fulfillment to my life as a person. Uh, so it's been, it's been really valuable. It's not an impact that I ever thought or expected I would make, having a helmet at work and sitting down on the job, really. Yeah. Charlie, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank you very much for your time here at the University of Florida. Thank you for telling us so much about the profession of being a race car driver. And thank you very much for sharing your impact far beyond the racetrack. We appreciate it. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for being on the University of Florida Motorsports Forum.